Hello, and welcome to the Kennedy Center, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Tonight, the Kennedy Center's Office of BSA and Accessibility is pleased to present winners of the 2015 BSA Playwright Discovery Competition. The play Playwright Discovery Competition, now in its 31st year, was founded by Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith and has encouraged thousands of middle and high school students with and without disabilities to explore the meaning and experience of disability through the art of script writing. This weekend, the playwrights of the eight winning senior division script have come to the Kennedy Center for mentoring from theater professionals as well as continued development of their outstanding plays. This evening, you will hear excerpts from four of those winning plays. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. Mutant Boy by Bennett Sher. A family of three is alone in an examination room in a children's hospital. Bennett is seated on an examination table wearing a hospital gown. This is me. I'm seven years old, and right there, the most important thing on my mind is that I'm halfway to Kanto in my Pokemon video game, and my Pikachu is about to launch a Thunderbolt attack on Jigglypuff. Yes! Honestly, I was not the most observant boy or at least I wasn't back then. I was a clueless boy in that group of normal little boys that were leapers before lookers. The boys that whirled around in circles wearing a backpack in the bus line, unwittingly clubbing children to either side of them. The boys that walked across kitchen floors with muddy boots on. But that was before this day. This is a day in April 2006. A Thursday, when I was seven years old, and my Pikachu was halfway to Kanto. You see, this was the exact time when the world caught on to the secret my body was keeping. I was not a normal boy. This was the moment that my life forever changed, and I was labeled like a canned food item. Bennett Share needs no refrigeration. Dr. Navarro's job as attending physician in orthopedics as a ch at a children's hospital requires him to give a handful of devastating diagnoses a day. How a family takes the news is different every time. He'll tell you some handle the news with resignation, knowing, what, knowing it was the expected or inevitable outcome. Their only outward sign of emotion is the thin, flat line they press their mouths into as they bow their heads, indicating that they understand what he has said. Others run from the room distraught. Those are the families that don't see the diagnosis coming. He always proceeds with caution and tries to break it to them gently. Please, sit. I'd like to show you Bennett's x-rays. He flips the small metal lever on the side of the light box. <gasps> That's me! I'm a spooky skeleton! I'm a bumpy skeleton? Yes, a very good observation, bumpy. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cher, your son has a condition called MHE, or multiple hereditary exostoses. Have you heard of this before? Uh, it's a genetic bone disorder where benign cartilage-capped bone tumors grow outward from the metaphyses of the long bones, the growth plates, and from the surface of the flat bones throughout the body. These hard, spiky bone tumors are called exostoses, or osteochondromas, uh, and they can vary widely in size and shape, from a sesame seed to a tennis ball. Uh, some tumors will have a stalk shooting off the bone uh, with a growth at the end that looks like, like broccoli. Ugh. Others will have a broad base attached to the bone and have an overall bumpy appearance, like rock candy. Candy bones! I want them gone. I know, Miss Cher, but it's not possible. 
once removed, do they have a tendency to grow back in the same spot? They'll, they'll never be gone. What does this mean for, for Bennett? Well, it, re it really depends on what stage and shape the tumors take, how fast they grow, how many he gets. Each osteochondroma can cause problems, including compression of nerves or blood vessels, shredding of the tendons and muscles around them, resulting in pain and loss of motion, skeletal deformities, short stature, limb length discrepancy, chronic pain and fatigue, mobility issues, early onset arthritis, and an increased risk of developing malignant tumor transformation called chondrosarcoma or bone cancer. Some patients have as few as two tumors, but most patients develop many more and the number of tumors can run in the hundreds. Bennett, by my estimation, has over 50 small to medium-sized osteochondromas. But right now, he's on the mild end of the spectrum, and he may indeed stay there. Growth is unpredictable. Pain and loss of motion, skeletal deformity, short stature, limb length discrepancy, chronic pain and fatigue, Mobility issues? I didn't know what those things were back then. But I knew that whatever just happened, it wasn't good for me. And somehow I did something wrong. Judging by the looks on my parents' faces, very, very wrong. Candy bones were a bad thing, and I had them. They're, they were highlighted for everyone to see on the x-rays. Multiple osteochondromas twinkling like a string of Christmas lights hung on the body of a boy. I felt exposed and sheepish, but I didn't know why. At seven years old, the best thing to do when you think you've been found out for something is to hide. I slid back off the long vinyl table and onto the floor beneath it. If I were home, I would have dragged the sofa cushions off the frame, tended them with a blanket, and made a cave to crawl into. I wanted to disappear. There's something I need to ask you. A MHE is a, it's most commonly a hereditary genetic disorder. 90% of the time in these cases, it takes a positive parent to have a positive child. It, it doesn't stay dormant and skip generations. Do either of you have known MHE or bone tumors? No, not, not me. Would you mind if I examined you? I didn't know much about marriage, but I was relieved for my parents. I suppose harboring a genetic disorder and not disclosing it to your partner is an offense right up there with adultery. But it looked like my parents weren't cheating on each other and keeping a defective chromosome hidden, they were in the clear. However, once Dr. Navarro started touching mom, I didn't know what to think. I don't know how dad handled it, but I felt nervous and uneasy when Dr. Navarro started massaging mom's shoulders. When he held her hands and rubbed her wrist, I glanced over to dad and wondered if he was looking. He was, and I was embarrassed for him. Whoa. When Dr. Navarro got to Mom's ankles and it looked like he was going to give her a foot massage, I was flushed and mortified. How was Dad not punching this man for touching Mom that way? Then it got really weird and awkward because Dr. Navarro did the same thing to Dad. I no longer knew what to think. I don't feel any osteochondromas in either of you. Realistically, you couldn't get to your ages and not know you had MHE. In a small number of cases, about 10%, it's a new gene mutation at work creating the disorder, and there's no hereditary influence. Most likely, I suspect that's what we're dealing with here, and most likely Bennett is a new mutation. Ah, uh, there. Did you catch that? He said it. Bennett is a mutant. At least from everything that was said that day, that was the only thing I understood. I, Bennett Sher, am Mutant Boy! Bennett now wears his hospital gown as a superhero, as a superhero cape. When a quarterback wins the Super Bowl, 
he goes to Disney World. When a child is just discovered to be a mutant boy, he goes to McDonald's drive through <laughs> I don't remember anything else about the drive home from the children's hospital that day except being incredibly hungry. Well, that in the moment we almost got killed flying through a red light. And there really should be a label on the ticket stub you turn into the hospital garage when you get your car. It should say something like, Warning! Catatonic parents should not operate heavy machinery. Back at home, Dad broke the rules on purpose for the first time ever. When he asked Dr. Navarro what they were supposed to do, the doctor said, Go home, love your son, and don't go on the internet. I think Dad stayed online for three straight days. But that was okay with Mom, because she was busy herself. She cried for three days straight. I mean, everything had changed, and it was all my fault, and I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Being a mutant sucked. I wanted to go back to the days when I was just a normal boy, before I was a mutant boy. But I gathered from the conversations I heard through closed doors that I was always a mutant, and they just didn't know it. Thinking back, it's difficult to describe this time. Have you guys ever watched Finding Nemo? Uh, you know, everything starts out swimmingly until, until it takes a horrifying turn and Nemo's mother and siblings are murdered in the first ten minutes? All of a sudden, through, through the magic of Disney with an Oscar-winning original score for best music, a family gets completely and totally messed up! Well, that, that's how it was for those first few days. Minus the singy-songy soundtrack. All of a sudden, my family was totally messed up. I looked to my parents for something. Anything that would make it all better. They were lost, and neither one of them seemed to know what to do. There appeared to, there appeared to be no plan, no subroutine on the flowchart of raising a child to handle this particular situation. My entire childhood was essentially... So far, a grand plan or complex algorithm. My mother did prenatal yoga, my father followed consumer guides on strollers, a professional consultant baby proofed the house, and when I turned two years old, they aggressively pursued the top pre preschools until the best one, in their opinion, admitted me. Having their children turn out to be, having their child turn out to be a mutant, threw them for a loop and the plan right out the window. The poor suckers never saw it coming. To them, the function of their inputs thus far should not have produced the output. Mutant boy. Most upsetting for me right after my diagnosis is how sad I made mom. She was quiet and inactive. And when she looked at me, her eyes filled with tears, even though her mouth forced a smile. I knew in my heart that I had hurt her, and I was so very sorry. I didn't want to make her cry, but I did. Deep down, I was afraid she no longer loved me. One time, when I was little, and before I knew you weren't supposed to, I swallowed a gumball, and it got stuck in my chest. This felt worse. I know now, this was my very first heartbreak. I wish my parents had talked to me about what was happening with them because aside from the pain in my chest, not knowing made me feel very alone. I stayed quiet around them out of fear. I was afraid if I spoke, it might make them feel worse. And I was sure I didn't want to hurt their feelings any more than I already had. Even though I wanted to ask a lot of questions, I didn't know what to ask or how to ask it. I felt detached from myself, like a bystander in my life, watching the bizarro version of the Cher family from the outside. The bizarro Shares were exhausted, crying in the house and trying to pretend that everything was okay out of it. They were suffering greatly, even when they had a permanent smile affixed to their faces. I guess they were trying to freeze what they could, their expressions. 
because everything else was in motion, out of their control. But that's what a disability diagnosis does to a family. It robs you of your control. A diagnosis is an event no one chooses. Whatever your normal was before is forever replaced with a new and uninvited normal. This is a very difficult thing to deal with. On the other hand, how you deal with the diagnosis is a series of events after that that you can choose. When MHE first entered our lexicon as a family, we were serenely paddling down a stream with a destination circled on the map, fully navigating as we intended. Then suddenly, three letters were spoken, and that forced us to alter course, go over a waterfall and into the rapids. After washing about for weeks, rudderless, a tributary appeared, and my parents wrestled our craft into that more charitable stream. Specialists were found, six of them in different hospitals. Surgeries were performed, 17 of them to date. Bones were lengthened with titanium devices, internally and externally, in arms and in legs. Metal rods, plates, and screws were implanted, too many to count. Therapies and rehabs were attended for hours and hours. Altogether, they might add to a year nonstop. That Thursday, in April 2006, while my Pikachu was halfway to Kanto, was my departure on this journey. Everything after the shock and the panic wore off became my charitable stream. But no one asks to be different. No one wants to stand out for the thing they can't control. No one wants to be a mutant boy. However, as William Shakespeare would have said, sweet are the uses of adversity. Some of the world's most famous mutants, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and the Hulk, you know, they all had their powers. And who knows? Somewhere on this journey, I may very well find mine. End of play. on a park bench, written by Paige Colvin. Lights up on a park bench. It is early in the morning and three teenagers share a bottle of some unidentified alcohol. I hate silence. Did you want to have a conversation? Conversations are boring. Read me one of your poems. What? No! Come on, I'm bored. I don't have any poems on me. Then make one up, I don't care. Just say something poetic and pretentious, just like you always did. Write your own poetry. But you're so good at it. You too? You hate poetry. I like siding with Violet. You hate siding with Violet. No. I hate when she sides against me, which she always does. I do not! Of course you do! Just like you hate being wrong. <laughs> Ow! Just do it, so please. For me. Alright, alright, fine. What do you want me to say? Uh, talk... Talk about right now. What? Say something poetic about this minute in time. Right here, right now. 
Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Oh, come on. It doesn't have to be award-winning. Just, just ramble. I, I don't think... Please? Okay. <laughs> Fine. It's three in the morning, and it's dark, and I'm kind of cold. Okay, try better. Fine. Fine. Okay. There are some lights glowing in the distance on that hill I can't remember the name of. There's a soft, whitish yellow, and some of them are more orange, and some of them are more pink. The stars are out, and they look similar, but they're tinier lights, brighter white. Too. Talk about something other than the light. Uh, I'm sitting on a park bench, and I've been ignoring the feeling of wood pressing into my back for the past hour. My shoelaces are unevenly tight, but I only noticed it just now. I can hear cars driving past, and sometimes the wind blows through the leaves on the trees, and it sounds like when you turn the pages in an old book. Whatever crappy alcohol you brought tastes bitter and sweet at the same time. I kind of hate it, but it feels good in my stomach. Like the nice kind of full after you haven't eaten in a while. Part of me desperately wants to go to sleep, but part of me wants to do something dangerous and exciting, and I wish I could watch the sunrise without my mom waking up early and noticing I've been gone all night. See? You'd miss it. Not this again. It's not like we were going to let it go. Come on, I was just kidding. You clearly weren't It doesn't kidding. matter. I wasn't serious. It sounded like you were serious when you were on the phone. I was just having a rough time. I'm okay now. Somehow, I don't believe you. Shut up. Are you seriously thinking of doing it? I don't... I don't know. I daydream about it sometimes. Yeah? Yeah. Like, like sometimes I'll be standing on a sidewalk next to a busy road and I'll watch the cars go by and wonder what it would be like just to step out onto the street or run right across like I'm playing some horrible game of Frogger and I wonder what getting hit by a car would be like. I think... It might be something like the time I was little and sprinting through the playground without paying attention. I slammed into the swing set and got the wind knocked out of me. My whole world went fuzzy and white, but if I got hit by a car, instead of catching my breath, everything would fade away at the end. Like fireworks that fizzle out until all you have left is a black sky. Maybe you should go to a slam poetry night instead. Shut up. It's, it's just a little daydream of mine. It's nothing major. <laughs> kind of major, Soph. Do you need to talk to us or something? No. Whatever. I'm fine. Forget I ever said anything, okay? Did you ever think about how you're going to do it? I don't know. Probably walking out onto the freeway. I mean, like, it'd suck for whoever hit me, but I'd write a note and tape it to my stomach and everything so people knew it was a suicide. I just don't think I could do it myself, like, like hanging or slitting my wrist. It needs to be like ripping off a band-aid or, or charging onto a freeway. How long have you felt like this? Guys, seriously, it's nothing. You don't have to pretend around us. We're your friends. It's okay to talk about your feelings. Jeez, 
What are you, my therapist? <laughs> no, this is your therapist. Right now, I'm just someone who will listen to you, so talk to me, sweetie. Don't call me sweetie. You sound like my mother. What if I called you sweetie? I'd punch you in the face. Got it. Listen, it's not important. It doesn't matter. What if you, like, went to hell or something? I don't believe in hell. <laughs> what do you believe in? I don't know. Death? How deep? Whatever. What about the people you left behind? Wouldn't you miss them? You can't miss things when you're dead. It's the biggest pro to this whole scenario. You don't know that. Maybe the afterlife is like... Watching a big movie of everyone you left behind when you died, and all anyone does is miss it. So, what, you're saying you miss me? Oh, crap, Sophia, of course we miss you. People in our lives die every day. You'd move on. But don't be so casual. Our lives wouldn't be the same without you. So, you'd have to find some other new clinically depressed teenage girl to wake up to wake you up at three in the morning and drag you to the park with her so she doesn't have to be alone with her thoughts. You would forget about me in a few months. No. We'd have to find a girl who laughs like a foghorn and writes on her arm when she doesn't have paper and recommends songs to us just because she thinks we would like them. A girl who rocks Doc Martens and sundresses and will curse out anyone who tells her what a girl should or shouldn't look like. And, and when someone calls me a, a fairy or mama's boy, a girl who isn't afraid to knock their teeth out. Anyone who isn't exactly like you, sitting on a park bench with us at three in the morning, will just remind us that you used to sit here instead. Jeez. What are we, in an indie movie? <laughs> End of scene. by Olivia Pop. I love her. I loved her. No, I love her. Lights up. Boy present sits on a small cushioned bench. Dr. Drake sits in a simple cushioned chair and holds a clipboard without a pen. So, you're saying this is just a simple story of broken teenage romance? No! No! It's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. There's no fault in our stars shit romance going on. I'm, I'm not heartbroken. I'm not even in love. I love, yes, but in love is a foreign concept to me. There's a difference. Romance is unfamiliar, unwanted, but my heart is slowly being torn out. I'm sorry, I'm not really understanding. I wouldn't expect you to. You've never faced the wrenching pain of Asperger's. It's not Asperger's per se, but what comes along with it? I have not. Never really, I never really understood the point of love or romance. I just want to feel some sort of connection to which you can relate, understand, depend on. There's no rush to do anything at all! happened to me? I'm not sure. What's your favorite number? Um, favorite? Uh, seven, I guess. <laughs> Cliched specialty, fair enough. <laughs> Mine is 47. It's a beautiful number. I challenge you to look around you. It's everywhere. But it's not just a number, it's Artemis. What? Artemis was 47. Names are poor descriptors. Why is a dog called a dog? Nobody knows why, but 
47, it's elegant, ubiquitous, comforting, just like... 47. I don't appoint the names, they appoint themselves. Uh, uh, look, look, just, just go with me. You don't have to understand me verbatim to see what I'm getting at. Lights up on a small but long table with some papers on it. Boy past sits boredly behind the table. I had to volunteer at a band concert for some community service hours. Simple enough. I don't remember first encounters, and this was certainly not an exception. I do remember, though, how at least I got to know a good friend. Hey! Hello. Artemis at least recognized me. I hate when people have like four classes with you and then still have no idea who you are. I'm here to volunteer. I assume that's what you're doing? It's Artemis, right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. It's the Olympian, Olympian goddess of the hunt. <laughs> yeah, kind of embarrassing name. I, I thought it was common knowledge, but apparently not many people know. I just brushed them off as ignoramuses, I guess. It's kind of a weird name, now that I think of it. Unique, though. I found it beautiful. Mind if I sit? Um, I guess. We got to know each other well. I had other friends, sure, and 47 really didn't seem any different than the rest, but she listened. So what's the problem? Which one? It was around December. I felt like I had found a real friend. I never really interacted much with anybody, really. Everyone else had people coming and going from their houses like it was frickin' Main Street. Wanna hang out? Yeah, sure, you're the first to ask. What does that mean? Why does everything have to be about finding so-called romance? Hey, there you are. Oh, sorry I'm late. There was never any awkwardness. Uh, don't worry. Were you waiting long? She seemed to legitimately care, something I'd never really seen in many people. Uh, nope, just uh, a couple of minutes. Good. It was her idea to kind of walk around downtown on campus on occasion. I enjoyed the time just being there. Nobody seems to understand the value of well-placed silences. So, uh, I heard you got into NYU. <laughs> yes, I did, but basically everyone kind of did. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the other ones. I, I want to get into, like, MIT or Harvard or Yale or Vanderbilt or Princeton. Hey, uh, I'm sure you'll do fine. What is it about me that is so different? There's no definition of normal, but there's definitely a definition of different. But that's not me either. I'm different than different, but I'm not normal. 47 sometimes noticed when I was feeling upset and asked what was wrong, but I wasn't feeling upset. It was depression. And I knew it. A dark shade descended. Food was bland. Even my face became blank. Unless you felt it, you can't seem to comprehend. What I slowly began to realize was that it was March. She was going to leave, but I had become so... I wouldn't venture to call it dependent, but so comfortable with her company that it was hard to let go. I always overreact. I start shaking, trembling, hyperventilating. And you said it yourself. You're different. Uh, different from different. And that's truly a fantastic thing. You know that? You love harder than anyone. Anyone would be lucky to have you. But that's not what I want. I'm not looking for romance. I shy away from intimate contact. I usually can't even stand the idea. I just need someone to bounce ideas off of her, someone who'll hear my nonsense when I can't handle myself anymore. So, a uh, close friend then, I suppose? I had that with 47, didn't I? 
certainly sounds like it. But good friendships never just end like that. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, I got in! Where? The one they built! All the other schools know, but, but I got in! I just got their financial aid package in my email. It's the same as NYU! That means I can go! Oh my god! Oh, I'm a mess! <laughs> wow! Dang! Oh, I can't believe it! Oh. I got into Vanderbilt, that's what. And I was happy for her. I tried to congratulate her. I didn't understand what was wrong with me. I tried to, 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 to hug her like the others did. Just hug her, I told myself. There's nothing wrong or weird about hugging people. I didn't understand why I couldn't. I don't know why it felt so wrong. You couldn't hug her? I couldn't, I, I couldn't. I don't know why, because all I was able to say was nice. Good job. I don't understand why it was so hard. Can I not express my feelings just a single measly? That's pretty good. Were you actually happy for her? Yes. It's the only thing I'm sure of right now in my life. But... That wasn't the worst of it. Other people could show their happiness. Some guy, one of her friends, went and talked to her. I could see them in my peripheral vision. Seeing how many other people could show their happiness and show, show their empathy, joy, expression. It was painful. My chest hurt with a burning, horrifyingly stinging pain, a roaring headache. I could feel buzzing in my eyes. We talked for a long time, and though I couldn't hear what they were saying, I knew it was everything that I couldn't say. And then they hugged right behind me, and I knew that I could never, never be like any. And that's what I knew. What? I cared for her. I, I cared that she knew what I was feeling. I cared that she knew that I cared. Because no one else in the world ever thought I cared. And I wanted to know that I cared more than anything else in this world. And being unable to express that, it's like, it's like trying to speak, but being constantly shoved under the water, drowning in the very thing that gives life to you. I knew that I loved her, because love is an ephemeral thing, something of transcendence, deep-rooted care and emotion that goes beyond anything. It's simply between two people. There's no room for error, misjudgment, deceit, or misunderstanding. I just don't know why it hurts so much. I want to know why I couldn't show what I feel. 47 was my stability. I couldn't bear to lose that. I can't bear to lose it. By the way, you, you've never called her 47 to her face, have you? Uh, but maybe you should. If you care this much, there has to be something reciprocal to it. There is a knocking sound. Dad, are you there? Artemis's last name isn't Drake. It's not, no. You thought I was... <laughs> uh, Dr. Fireman has a daughter named... Hey. Um, what are you doing here? You must be Artemis. Uh, you're good. How'd you guess? From Dr. Fineman, uh, but he's in a meeting at the moment. I can just head out. Uh, actually, I think you should stay. Is something wrong? Nothing that you don't know. But I have to ask. Do you know what you're doing next year? No? 
Oh. I know you've been struggling a lot lately, but for right now, it's still only April and September is eons away. I guess. And thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. <laughs> Making it sound like a goodbye. Oh, stop reading between the lines. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, there's not much I can do at this point. For all the missed opportunities. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> oh, you know, maybe I'll give you daily hugs. You seem a hell of a lot calmer. <laughs> I think I am. Thanks, 47. What? You're 47. I look 47? No, no, no. no. Uh, uh, all right. I'll take your word for it. But while we're here, I, I think it's time for some sort of explanation you've been holding in, outside of the hints you've been expecting me to pick up. You sure? Of course. After all, what could make me leave now? Huh. All my fears assuaged in a single sentence. Would you believe that, 47? <laughs> End of play. Lights up on a small barber shop. Sal stands behind one of the barber's chairs. Bobby stands behind the other, packing his stuff. Hey, we have to close in 10. I know. So what are you getting ready for? Well, Jerry's going to be here. Oh, right, Jerry. Why? You know, one day he ain't going to come. He always comes. Yeah, one day he ain't. And I'll be glad when he doesn't. Hey, have some respect, huh? Jerry is my best customer. He's been coming in here for the last 15 years, ever since I started cutting here. Oh, Jerry! What? Who's there? Who said that? Hey, it's me, Sal. I know, kid. I'm just grabbing your balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure you are. All right, Jerry, take a seat, huh? Uh, is, is there anybody else planning on coming in? I don't I don't want to hold anyone up. Oh, you're fine, Jerry. You're fine. You're on time as usual, buddy. Uh -huh. Like clockwork. <laughs> it's always the same routine. You say... Jerry, how do you want it? And he says... You know, Sal, you always do. Marge always says you cut it best. The best of anyone who's ever cut it. You don't even know he's bald. I know. Uh, I love getting my hair cut. Well, thinking you're getting your hair cut. Hey, Jerry, how's the old lady? What? He said, how's the old lady? Oh, she's doing good. She you know you're here, Jerry? Oh, sure. She had to go out to the store to pick up some salad. <laughs> she's trying to eat healthy, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. She's still on that new diet, huh? She sure is. <clears throat> I'm real proud of my March staying healthy. My doctor says I'm going to live a real long time. And so she says to me... Jerry, if you're going to live a real long time, I'm going to live a real long time with you. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, it would be if it was true. It was true, but Jerry's mind is on repeat. Like that movie with uh, Bill Murray in it, huh? What's that movie, Jerry? Strikes. No, that ain't it. Uh, Groundhog Day. Yeah, that's the one. Groundhog Day. Ghostbusters. It's sort of like that. I mean, he repeats the day over and over. Only I know it ain't the movie because I don't repeat every day with him. It's just in his head. His old lady, for instance. I, she ain't touched no diet and she ain't been to the store buying salad. She's dead. Quiet, Bobby. I read her old bit in the paper in 97. Well, every day he tells me she's out buying salad, she's trying to get healthy, I'm real proud of my Marge. Same thing with his kids. 
He thinks he still knows Jimmy and Diane, but he don't. So, Jerry, tell me about those kids of yours, huh? Oh, they're good. Now, Diane just uh, took this big case about that murder in Mississippi. It was a disaster. Uh, looks like a sure thing, too. She forged evidence, went to prison. Uh, and Jim, Jim's getting along just fine. He's going to go back to school, you know? Wants to study business. Who'd have dunk my own son? Jim Robinson would become a businessman. <laughs> you know, Jimmy works down the street at the corner store. Yeah, I know that kid. Oh, uh, he's gonna wear fancy Wall Street suits, buying and selling stocks. He stocks the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of my kid, Sal. You got kids, don't you? Little Clarice, right? Uh, what is she for now? Uh, 19, actually. Ah, uh, she must be starting to say cute stuff like, I love Dada. I'm dropping out of school. <laughs> oh, playing patty cake and all that. I'm moving in with Jeremy. Probably watches that Sesame Streets in the morning. I'm pregnant. Please send money. Ah, uh, <laughs> I miss that age. Uh, me too. Uh, they were so cute. And safe. But don't worry, Sal. They're still cute when they're older. It's just a different kind of cute. Yeah, I'm sure you're right, Jerry. Yeah. So you're never going to tell them. What's the point? What's the point? The point is when you wouldn't have to pretend with the guy. You wouldn't have to pretend to talk about Marge or the, or the kids or any of that shit. You know? Don't be such a jerk, huh? I'm the jerk? Look at you pretending to cut the old man's hair. Pretending to care about his daughter's case and his son's education and his wife's diet. All of which are over and done and squashed and ruined. He needs someone to talk to. Bullshit. He don't even remember talking to yesterday. And tomorrow he won't remember talking today. He's a dinosaur. Hey, watch it, all right? Tell me, Sal, you take him every day, huh? Why do you sit him down and snip above his head and then send him on his way every single day? Well... For the money. That's right. Congratulations. You're a greedy human being, just like everybody else in this world. The only difference is you found someone stupid enough to pay 12 bucks every day for nothing. Jack shit. His time's up, Sal. I gotta piss. When I come back, that artifact better be out of my shop. Hey, Jerry. Mm. Looks like you're all set. Thank you, Sal. Hey, it's my pleasure. <clears throat> you need a mirror, Jerry? No, no, sir. I trust you, Sal. You're the best barber there ever was. Yeah, I'm sure I don't deserve that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. How much do I owe you? It's uh, 12 bucks. Hey, look at that. I got 12 bucks exactly. Always seems to be that way, doesn't it? <laughs> Thanks. My pleasure. Hey, Jerry! What? Looks like you dropped 12 bucks. Did I? Yeah, it's oh. right here. Let me check. Oh, yeah, I, I swore I had some cash in here. Yeah, here you go. Don't forget to tell Marge I say hello, huh? I, I won't, Sal. And I'll be back in two weeks for another trip. All right. <laughs> See you tomorrow. End of play. to you, VSA works with theater and arts education organizations all over the country to bring playwriting to students with and without disabilities in schools. Every young writer in the VSA Playwright Discovery Program is asked to think deeply and then to write a play about the disability experience. As you can see by the readings this evening, the disability experience means different things to each of these young writers. In the varied scripts we receive, 
we see the rich tapestry of our humanity reflected back to us. You saw four shows this, four shows this evening. We did four uh, last night in the Terrace Gallery. But now it is my honor to introduce to you all eight of the 2015 BSA Playwright Discovery Senior Division winners. The author of 3 a.m. on a park bench, Paige Colvin from Larkspur, California. The author of Cade Klein, Leah Davis of Dallas, Texas. The author of Journey to the Mind's Eye, Christopher Huntsman of Boise, Idaho. The author of 12 Bucks, David Merkel of Glen Rock, New Jersey. The author of 47, Olivia Pop of Ann Arbor, Michigan. The author of Mutant Boy, Bennett Cher of Princeton, New Jersey. You sadly had to leave us. The author of Personification, Molly Kate Toombs of Richmond, Virginia. And the author of Where Colors Rest in the Nighttime, Catherine Valdez of Miami, Florida. Let's give them all a round of applause. And please, let's thank our wonderful musician, Steve Fry. Thank you all so much for coming to tonight's BSA Playwright Discovery Program. Have a good night and a happy holiday.